The White House is demanding Fox News retract coverage of the bribery allegations against President Joe Biden's son, Hunter, as the FBI informant in the heart of the GOP's allegations against Biden, Alexander Smirnoff, was indicted on lying to the feds earlier this month. In a letter to Fox News, White House spokesperson Ann Sams accused the network of, quote, failing to retract, correct, or update its reporting on false allegations made by Smirnoff. Sams attacked the network for covering the claims against the president's son, quote, aggressively. Smirnoff's claim that Hunter Biden used his father's name to solicit millions in bribes from the Ukrainian energy company Burisma was later found out to be false, according to reporting from CNN. In a statement to The Hill, a Fox spokesperson said Fox News Media has reported on all key developments since the announcement that Alexander Smirnov was charged with lying to the FBI, featuring the story prominently. We will continue to report on developments in all aspects of the ongoing investigations, hearings and trials. Now, per The Hill, authorities say Smirnov's claims about Biden came from Russian intelligence personnel. During a seven-hour closed-door deposition yesterday, Hunter Biden said his father never profited from his business and denied working for foreign countries, according to a 229-page deposition. A closed-door deposition lasted right around seven hours, according to Hunter Biden's legal team. And the transcript really sheds light on what exactly happened. We saw the deaths of Hunter Biden's own mother and sister back in the 70s, as well as the death of his brother from cancer come up when the president's son faced questions about putting his dad on speakerphone during meetings with business associates. Uh, that was a claim made by business partner Devin Archer. Hunter admitted to that, but also played it off as very normal behavior with his family saying, quote, in our family, when you have a call from, I call him or he calls me, maybe he calls my grandkids or one of my children, you always pick up the phone. It's something that we always do. Lawmakers also asked him about money received from CEFC, a Chinese energy company that House Republicans allege has ties to the Chinese Communist Party. The president's son saying, quote, I don't know the exact amount, but I know that it was all completely legal. It was incredibly ethical. Investigations editor at the Washington Examiner, Sarah Bedford, joins us now to weigh in. Thanks for coming on, Sarah. Thanks for having me. So I want to start with just your initial reaction to Fox News's response there. Uh, their claims about how they covered, you know, Hunter Biden in this case and their retraction of some of their claims. Well, I think, you know, at the time, there wasn't knowledge of whether the underlying claims were credible, but there was a lot of reasons for news outlets, for members of Congress to believe that the source himself was credible. It's something that the Justice Department had determined on its own. You know, uh, former Attorney General Bill Barr had tapped the then U.S. Attorney in Western Pennsylvania, Scott Brady, to look into this. He had a team dig into some of the details behind the allegations that were in that FD-1023 form that we've heard so much about, the travel that Smirnoff had um, undertaken in Europe during the time frames when he was said to have been meeting with Burisma executives matched up with the evidence that the U.S. attorney could find, for example. And this was an FBI informant that had been relied upon extensively in previous investigations. So there were reasons to lend some credence to this allegation when it first emerged. And so, you know, it was Republicans who, who pretty clearly overplayed their hand on how much they hyped the allegation itself. But there was no reason to discard this as a um, you know, misinformation at the time that it emerged last year. Yeah, and I would say, too, that, uh, you know, it's perfectly reasonable for a media outlet to cover an allegation as big as this, especially as it's being advanced in the impeachment inquiry by the House Oversight and Judiciary Committees. Um, and it's actually quite inappropriate by that White House spokesperson, Ann Sams, to um, basically try to turn the media into a lapdog for Biden. And, you know, it's not lost on me either that Ann Sams is the same person who lied about the contents of the Robert Herr report by claiming that it didn't find that Joe Biden had willfully mishandled classified information when I'm pretty sure that was on page two of the report. But I want to ask you, Sarah, too, about your coverage of the transcript that came out from Hunter Biden's uh, deposition to Congress, um, because you have this article out in The Washington Examiner with six big takeaways. I want to ask you about one of them to start, which is uh, the, the claim that Hunter Biden made in regards to why he joined the board of Burisma. And he apparently said it had to do with him thinking that it would help them push back against Russian 
Russian influence. Can you take us through what he said about his work on the Burisma board? Sure. You know, obviously, Hunter Biden's service on the Burisma board and the very lucrative amounts he was paid to hold that position have been really controversial. And so Hunter Biden, especially against this current political backdrop, tried to make the argument that the reason he accepted that position was because he really cared about countering Russian influence in Ukraine, his, his argument being that Ukraine was an ostensibly independent energy company within Ukraine, although there's evidence that that was not necessarily true, uh, given that Slachevsky was under a, Slachevsky is the chairman of, of Burisma, was under investigation for corruption. But nonetheless, he argued that this was an independent private company within Ukraine whose success was really necessary to pushing back against the, the Russian incursions into the energy market at that time. However, the fa this idea that, that Hunter Biden's foreign dealings were motivated by this pure-hearted anti-Russian sentiment is, is really contradicted by some of the other overseas work that Hunter Biden was doing uh, in the several years surrounding this, including the fact that he and his brother pocketed millions of dollars from a Chinese company that invested heavily in Russian energy that was, in fact, part of the Chinese government's efforts to increase its cooperation with the Russian government in terms of energy. And also that Hunter Biden, on at least one occasion that we know of, invited a Russian oligarch to a dinner where his father was in attendance. And shortly after that dinner took place, uh, companies of his business associates received more than $3 million from that Russian oligarch. So this idea that Hunter Biden was motivated just by his uh, desire to protect the Western world against Russia doesn't really pass the smell test. So we've seen, you know, the wealthy families associated with America's biggest politicians, Jared Kushner pocketing a $2 billion investment, that's billion with a B, from a Saudi Arabian prince after working on the Middle East under the Trump administration being within the administration. So it's pretty common in the United States to have members of powerful families have elite business deals with large corporations overseas. And now we have Biden testifying on the record here that, you know, his father didn't benefit from his business in any way. We also have, you know, Smirnov's testimony being called into question. It turns out that the intelligence he got wasn't real. It came from Russian officials. So how do we move forward with the investigation of Hunter Biden? Do you see there being a case there? And is it one that you think can harm Joe Biden? Well, I think uh, to, to circle back to one of the first things you said, there's no evidence that Joe Biden benefited from the business and he personally pocketed any money from this. That is not where this investigation started out. It's not where these allegations started out. And I think Democrats have really successfully moved the goalposts. But where this started was whether Joe Biden had any awareness of the overseas business dealings that his son was engaged in that created pretty clear conflicts of interest during his vice presidency. And Joe Biden said while he was running for president, that he had no idea what his son was doing in Ukraine or China, that his son had never made a dollar from Chinese enterprises, and that he had never spoken to any of Hunter Biden's business partners. Now, there is voluminous evidence that Joe Biden lied to the American people repeatedly about this. I think that Democrat, uh, Republicans, excuse me, have in some ways potentially overplayed their hand in suggesting that this went further than all of the things I just described, which are pretty problematic for a president to have entanglements in China, for example, that could compromise his ability to, to, to you know, be an objective actor when it comes to Chinese policy and opened him up to a lot of criticism. But is there evidence that Joe Biden personally profited off this business? No. And because those goalposts have been successfully moved, and that is what Republicans set the expectation of what success looks like in the impeachment inquiry, I do think that you could start to see this lose steam as the election approaches. Yeah, and so far we've basically had this circumstantial evidence, um, for example, Tony Bobulinski's testimony that Joe Biden was indeed the big guy who was getting that 10 percent cut. And then we also have some testimony from Hunter regarding his dealings with CEFC. And there was this sort of infamous message where he suggested that his father was sitting next to him at the time that he was trying to perhaps extort some money from some Chinese businessmen. What else did Hunter Biden testify to in regards to CEFC? You point out in your piece that there there were perhaps some mismatches in terms of the timeline of when he did business for them. And then he also, of course, said that his father was not sitting next to him when he sent that text message. 
Yeah, Hunter Biden's explanation of that text message was really interesting because there's circumstantial evidence to suggest that he was, in fact, uh, with his father or near his father on the day that he sent that message on July 30th, 2017. Hunter Biden was photographed at his father's Delaware house. And he also testified in the deposition this week that um, he sent the text message to the wrong recipient and an, an accidental misfire on the text message. But several days after he sent that message, he did end up receiving a six-figure wire from the CEFC. So it doesn't really make sense how, if he had, in fact, sent that threat to the wrong party, he somehow ended up actually getting money from the correct party just a few days later. Again, Hunter Biden's timeline on when he began working for CEFC does not quite match up with what we've learned from the contents of his laptop and from the witness testimony of Tony Bobulinski. Tony Bobulinski told the committee and the FBI that Hunter Biden and his uncle James Biden started working with CEFC while his father was vice president, but they just didn't start accepting payment from CEFC until spring 2017, until Joe Biden left office, because it would look bad. And again, there's documentary evidence that supports Bobulinski's version of events. So it sounds like, you know, we've had so many people come in and out of public office in the U.S., you know, the Biden family. Just the fact that I think Hunter Biden was on the payroll of a foreign energy company is a conflict of interest. I think any kind of ties like that to foreign entities should be illegal for anyone high up in public office in the United States of America. It seems very obvious to me. It could very well be the case that there was, you know, policies made, deals put on the table or deals taken off of the table uh, between Jared Kushner when he was handling the Middle East under the Trump administration. That led to, when he started a private equity firm, leaving the White House, getting that $2 billion investment. It seems to me that the proper way forward is to have some prevention of this kind of corruption, that there shouldn't be any ties to foreign entities for them to profit. Are any of the Congress people that are working on the impeachment inquiry, to your knowledge, also working on legislation to prevent this kind of corruption in the future? They have. And, you know, when, when uh, committees have to submit subpoenas or request witness testimony, especially with the House Oversight Committee, which is helping to lead the impeachment inquiry, they do have to state uh, under congressional rules a legislative purpose for why they are making those requests. And there have been statements of legislative purpose about looking into anti-corruption laws that could prevent this sort of thing in the future. And in particular, we've heard lawmakers talk quite a bit about reforms to the Foreign Agents Registration Act, something that Hunter Biden is not criminally charged with having Having violated, but Republicans have certainly accused him in the court of public opinion of not properly registering as a foreign agent for the work he did for Burisma and CEFC and other foreign interests. Farah was not really enforced aggressively before the Trump administration. And then under the Trump DOJ, uh, Farah was enforced more aggressively. It was enforced against Paul Manafort. It was enforced against Rick Gates and some other Trump associates. And so now, you know, the DOJ is sort of in a position where it is looks like it is engaging in a bit of a double standard for not enforcing Farah nearly as aggressively as it was, it was enforced against Trump's associates. Really, no one involved in the Burisma affair registered under FARA, but three people have done so retroactively just uh, in the past year or so after this has been under criminal investigation. And so I think the FARA reform legislation is probably the most likely outcome to this whole saga. We're going to have to leave it there. But Sarah, thank you so much for joining us today on Rising. Thank you.